and, and an opportunity for us to welcome back uh, to the AA Tom Emerson, um, uh, former unit master here, former council member at the AA. Uh, I think Tom has said that he might show a snippet or two of things that might have emerged here over the years teaching um, that find new lives in some of the projects that will be presented this evening with Stephanie McDonald founded uh, an office that's three times the size of the AA in the sense that it's called 6A uh, Architects um, and located not far from here, just a few minutes to the east um, uh, here in the West End. Uh, they founded the studio in 2001 um, and since that time, and that's almost exactly the moment in fact that Tom starts teaching, uh, there has unfolded a project that puts them today very much at the forefront of what I think we could all call in, in various ways the New English. Um, a, a term that one often doesn't hear in this building, um, but that is, I would say, absolutely embodied in the incredibly elegant, incredibly refined, critical and intelligent projects that the studio has done for the better part of a decade now, and increasingly not just here in London, um, um, but in cities and, and locations uh, around the world. Um, it is a project that, has, that is filled with paradox and intelligence and wit. Um, not coincidentally, one of the books that you'll see back in the uh, uh, South Jury Room this evening that we've got copies of, a uh, beautiful text that was published in 2013 that 6A produced with Irene Scalbert titled Never Modern, uh, captures I think something of, uh, uh, of the knowingness and wit and intelligence of the project that 6A is unfolding. Um, as they say on, uh, in the book, neither, um, we neither anticipate the revolution like the moderns nor recapitulate the traditions like the postmoderns. This is a project that's incredibly carefully positioned in the culture of architecture um, and in ways that uh, uh, as I say, I think put it at absolutely the forefront of all of those discourses, disciplines, and ways of working today that are trying to renegotiate the impending, impressive uh, weight of the last century's work on what modern architecture is supposed to be. Um, it, is a, it is a project that believes deeply in the presence of time in our world, and as they say, the, the presence of time and the weight of objects and how they exist in the world, and that's something that you'll see demonstrated clearly in many ways in the different projects that that Tom will show uh, tonight, along with their collaborators uh, in the studio. Um, 6A are known for their incredibly kind of nuanced um, and elegant, uh, and I think more than anything, kind of self-aware demonstrations of space and material and the way in which those affect um, how we all live and work in, in buildings and the spaces of the city. Uh, this book is really very much the thing that prompted uh, a conversation that we've had over the last few months to try and get Tom to come back in and update us, uh, the work of the studio. It's wonderful to be able to do that tonight, to say that it's a book that's also produced by someone else who, who taught here at the A for many years, Irene Scalbert, and is the outcome of a series of conversations really over many years, I reckon, within the studio and the work that Tom and Stephanie and everyone in the studio is doing. Uh, designed by John Morgan, who works with us, uh, of course, on AA Files, uh, reviewed and edited by Pamela Johnston. As I say, we will finish this talk with a chance for you to get a copy of the book, and while Tom and Stephanie are here, a chance to get that signed, which I would recommend. It's an absolutely beautiful object in a studio that's incredibly, incredibly interested in the presence and reality of objects in the world today. Um, and the book is genuinely an embodiment and not just a demonstration of that interest. Their recent projects uh, include two, two galleries here in London, Raven Row and Spitalfields, which I'm sure many of you know and that was nominated for the Sterling Prize, the South London Gallery in Peckham, recently on the Albemarle Street uh, project with Paul Smith. Uh, the studio was presented with the 2014 Civic Trust Award. Um, recent projects include an apartment building in North London um, and many competition winning entries that are coming to fruition in different ways today and I think we'll get a chance to see some of those. Please join me in welcoming back to the A, Tom Emerson. Uh, thanks Brett and um, good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, Brett, I feel like you've just summarized my whole talk there. Um, <laughs> um, but I just wanted to start a little bit with the title, Never Modern, and when um, Brett um, invited me to come and give this talk, he said specifically, 
come and talk about the book. It was just after it came out last summer. And um, I'm not going to do that, partly uh, because I can't. It is, it's a, um, the book is a collaboration um, with Irene Skelberg um, and, and with John Morgan, who we've worked with at Raven Row and obviously does works with Print Studio and Files. And, and I would say that you could say the notion of collaboration is really the subject of the talk or how we do things together. Um, I first came here, I think, in 2000, 99 or 2000, and I met Irene in the Print Studio, in the doorway of the Print Studio. Um, and he was preparing the kind of annual first year trip to Paris. And he'd prepared a project um, for the students to do on the, that, that sort of long <coughs> weekend. And Tony Swanell, who was also teaching first year at the time, uh, wanted me to set a project which was based around the work of Georges Perec, the writer who I'd written my dissertation about. Anyway, this was interfering with Irene's plans and he was getting a little shirty about it. And they started having a full-blown argument in the door well, doorway um, next door. And at one point, <coughs> Irene said, look, Tony, if we're going to do this argument properly, let's get a bottle of wine and go to the bar. Um, and that really is the sort of the beginnings of now kind of 15 years of conversations um, with Irene. We set up our studio very shortly after that and he's sort of been like a kind of a friend and um, kind of companion along the way. And the book really came out of trying to, trying to give a shape to those conversations and the responses that he'd had to the work. So the book really explores about how the city, how people, how culture, how architecture, how our story basically is the intertwining of accident, intelligence, imagination, chance, opportunism. And this talk is not about the book, although it shares many of the ideas. This talk is about reuse, not, a, not as an alternative to the new, but as a kind of new reality. The only condition we have today, with more in common with a pre-modern mindset um, in which everything in the world is interconnected. And here we owe a lot to um, the work of Bruno Latour, the French anthropologist, who wrote the book We Have Never Been Modern, which has been at the center of many of these conversations. <coughs> and really in that book, he sets out this argument that when we became modern, we separated everything. Um, and, and it's that separation between nature and culture that has put us into the difficulties we are in today. And that for the first time since becoming modern, and I'll come on to what that really means, um, it's the first time that we've been forced to sort of push culture and nature back together to tackle uh, the, the issues of climate change and uh, kind of world, world economics that have been around us for the last sort of decade, last five years in particular. So I'm going to talk about some projects from our office, 6A Architects, which as Brett said, uh, Steph, Stephanie and I started in 2001, and some of the work f by students from um, the studio that I run in ETH in Zurich. Reuse, like design, I believe is cautionary and evolutionary. It's an attempt to repair <coughs> and, transform and, and transformation as opposed to invention and revolution. We need to design without the revolutionary zeal of the <coughs> moderns to rebuild the world anew, but design with caution, even precaution, of the pre-moderns. One in which we can connect the divisions between nature and culture, between the large and the small um, that were made since we became modern. So what is modern? Um, according to REM, and this year's Biennale, it's the last hundred years, 1914 to now. According to Latour, it's from the 18th century onwards, the Enlightenment, rationalism, uh, the Industrial Revolution. And actually, there's a, an even longer description, and this is, comes from my mother, who's here tonight, I have to be careful, she's a historian. And um, she described it as what is not ancient history and what is not the Dark Ages, so from the medieval period onwards. And to some extent, I would say that... Sorry, my computer's just... Um, and to some extent, I think it's all of them. And we can sort of... Uh, we can 
find our way through different, different definitions of the modern. But the most important thing is that reuse is not foundational, and I think that that is what is modern. Design and construction are the processes by which we can use and reuse everything from nature, the built environment, objects, even genes today. We need to stop looking at nature outside of us, as outside of ourselves, but rather with it be within nature. We need to work naturally. Architecture and construction are naturally mimetic, and imitation and evolution are fundamentally human and natural. Evolution, not revolution. No one invented the chair. We just started sitting down. Then we learned how to be comfortable. Then we learned how to have tastes. But basically, we just wanted to sit together. Design and bricolage are fundamentally collective and collaborative processes. It's a way of passing knowledge on. And this is the first of a couple of photographs by the artist Richard Wentworth, um, who Steph and I met as students at the RCA in the mid-90s, and who's become a very important figure for our practice, but also a sort of very great friend. And he sort of, his ideas come with us throughout our work. So this is how nature grows, <coughs> diversifies, and this is how we learn, by imitation. Designing should be the antidote to so many modern errors of founding, colonizing, or breaking with the past. It's an antidote to the hubris of modernism and the search for absolute certainty, absolute beginnings and radical departures. Modern man as master of the universe. So let's start at the beginning. So this is a fairly big slide, architecturally. But I don't want to talk about classicism. The thing I'm interested in here is in the memory of construction, in the way, probably one of the oldest architectural stories of all, the way that the kind of the triglyphs are a memory of the beams coming through um, above the columns, and how the fluting in the column, how the fluting in the columns is a memory of kind of reeds bunched up together, and the architecture and humans have a memory. And that's not just representational, it's also in the kind of small actions of repair. And this is a photograph from a temple in Japan where the footing has been replaced so many times after being rotten that somebody came and did a wood joint in stone. And it's a photograph that <coughs> our colleague Takesh, Takeshi Hayatu, who's a student here, um, first brought, brought to the office, I think, many years ago, but has been a kind of very powerful um, image of a certain type of care, a certain type of precaution. Then, of course, the kind of our mimetic nature also gets confused sometimes. And this is also by Richard Wentworth. Um, but maybe that's why, that's what makes design so important. And I just want to go um, from there to, I would say, exactly 10 years ago. Let's call it March 2004. You might recognize the room. It's the front member's room upstairs. And it's a series of models that um, we did in the unit with uh, Peter Beard, DIP2, on non-systematic structures. And it was about material shifts. This is a 1 to 10 model of the structure of the, um, the Church of the Autostrada by Michelucci, just outside Florence. <coughs> it's a building made of in-situ concrete, um, but obviously built in timber first. And then, strangely, given the last slide of the Japanese column, there's even then a casting in aluminium of the reproduction in timber. So this idea of materials permanently imitating one another and shifting. And the other um, model in there, these photographs are in fact by Sue Barr, again, another kind of long-time long member of the AA, is the arts barn by Alison Peter Smithson, built in Bath, uh, in the late 80s, and it's a kind of proto-ruin. Um, I studied in Bath for my undergraduate, and this was a shell when we arrived. It is a project that's sort of, it's like a kind of future archaeology. It had a very odd structure, these kind of lintels placed in the wall with no openings, as if they were kind of anticipating change. And um, it wasn't fitted out, it was just walls and a roof and a kind of great big hall. Um, but I suppose that these buildings slightly anticipate this idea of structure, the idea of 
kind of built form being about the user, uh, the, the exaggerated footings of the church of the autostrada are really about sort of pushing yourself up to it, about people leaning against it. This is a church at the intersection of two motorways. People never arrive on time. They're just stopping. So he kind of inflated the structure to be like sort of rocks to hide behind. And similarly, the Smithsons, I think, were thinking about a kind of a future. It wasn't a master plan. It was more, let's see if we can sort of point in one direction or point towards the future. And I think that these projects are also anticipatory in the sense that they're very, very collective. These were made by the whole unit. These were group works, these were collaborative works. And that's been something which I think is both visible and invisible throughout. This next image is a building that was designed and constructed by my students at ETH in 2010 when I arrived there. And the one of the big differences between, let's say, teaching here or in Cambridge, as I did after, after here, and ETH, is that the unit system, as we know it, and I guess it's probably still the same somewhere, anywhere between 10 and 20 people, normally about 14, if I remember rightly, um, is a sort of, it's a kind of natural group. There's a natural community there. You can all sit around a, di a, a dinner table, a meeting table, and get to know each other. I arrived at ETH, and I had 48 students. And the question came up, how do you make a community? How do you get to know that number of people? And it's also a semester system, so so much faster than the year system that we have here. And so we decided, well, why don't we build a building that we can all go into? And that maybe in that process of designing and building together, that that will naturally form some kind of community. So the brief was to design an enclosure to host a lecture that we could all get into, plus a lecturer. And there, were, there was two weeks to do it, and zero budget. And so they did a 24-hour competition, uh, design competition between all the students. Being in Switzerland, we voted on everything. Um, and we found the winner, which was this, uh, basically a box, like a little chapel, made of basically reclaimed material. Um, the idea of reusing materials is more economic than polemical. Uh, no real interest in recycling per se, but I think that the idea of reuse as a kind of collective activity is interesting. And it was all done without power tools. It was all done with hammers and nails and hand saws uh, in a two week period. A quite extraordinary kind of mobilization of people, of, um, of materials, of kind of imaginations, of procedures. Um, and uh, the process of using hammers and nails only was not so much a kind of ideological one. It was partly what one might call the health and safety. 48 people with power tools is kind of scary. Um, but it's also about the democratization of construction. That within, within a group of architecture students, you always get those who are really good at making things. They've been making things since they were um, tiny children. And then you also get others who've never really picked up a saw before, yet alone a piece of wood or a hammer. But everybody can learn to knock in a a nail in an afternoon, and everybody can participate. And in fact, I just received this book today in the post. I'd ordered it on Abe months and months ago. Opened it, it's a 1976 catalog by Hans Hollein called Transformations. And then there you have it, a whole sheet of just hammers <coughs> of different scales. And I thought, well, of course, bashing things is one of the very fundamental ways of making things. You, you either bash things, cut things or cook things. Um, there aren't that many ways. And then I was so, so sort of excited about getting the book, I opened it rather abruptly. And being um, uh, from 1976, the glue is now as brittle as glass, and it broke instantly. And <laughs> I guess that happens to architecture too. Um, but yeah, so that's, that is what made this little structure. And the pine boards, I suppose, the aged pine boards of these kind of reclaimed materials are, in this slide, transformed into jarrah, which is an uh, Australian hardwood which was used for making railway sleepers. 
um, very, very hard. It starts out more purple than this, but really um, quite an extraordinary material. And it's what we used to build um, a small house in East London called the Tree House. It's sliced up and then used as a cladding, unfinished, it needs no treatment. It was a very small project, a very low budget project, and it seemed the most direct way of laying out what seemed like a sort of horizontal log into the back garden. The house is laid out more or less on a slope. It is for a family where the mother of the family is, um, is wheelchair bound and she can't basically live in the house vertically anymore. So it was basically to enable her to live horizontally to get from the house to the garden and sort of to lay it out um, around, um, around the tree uh, which she was very, very, very fond of. So just as the tree was the center of the design of the house, she became also the center of the house again. Um, and of course we all have memories. The tree bent, the building bent around the tree. We never really used this project on the right by Herzog and de Meuron as a precedent. It was never really discussed, but I think we all have memories and they were very influential on us when we were students. Um, so I think there's a sort of latent memory there rather than a precedent. So there, there's, there's another example of the sort of the, the, the easy cut and fix of timber. And again, this is not the same project. It hasn't burnt down. This is in Spitalfields in, um, in East London. It's a detail of uh, uh, Raven Road, the Contemporary Art Foundation that we did, uh, that was opened in 2009. This is the roof of the new building. These great big sorts of kind of like chimney stack roof lights, uh, canon lumière, as Corb would call it. Um, and it's really the product, you could say, of this photograph. This is a photograph in 1971 of the building just after the fu uh, fire ripped through it. It's an extraordinary photograph where, which we never really knew what to do with when we found it, it except kind of admire it, the, the, the resilience of architecture, the kind of 18th century interior, that despite this fire, it's still there. That photograph came along with about 70 others in a shoebox in the London Metropol Metropolitan Archive. And it became the most mysterious, you could say, um, sorry, I was going to go straight. Um, one of the most mysterious kind of bodies of evidence that we've ever had with a project. The photographs date from 1905 to 1972. They are by several different photographers, obviously, over a sort of 70-year 70 70 period, but they are unnamed, uncredited, and they became this sort of... Um, resounding chamber. We kept on trying to work out what to do with it. The most interesting thing about it is the way that you could see the city pass through one building. This is in 1905. This is when Spitalfields has, has grown, has declined in the 19th century, has come up again. Um, this is it in the 60s. The same building in the late 60s. In the late 60s, Spitalfields was just about to be demolished. Um, Ian Nairn writes very movingly about a place that nobody cares about. So to see the city, kind of the life of the city, the story of the city, to pass through these interiors, this is in the late 60s again, this building doesn't exist anymore, it's gone. This extraordinary photograph where they put the dark furniture on the dark side and the light furniture on the light side. I mean, Christian Boltansky couldn't have done it better. Um, I've since found out why it's like that, and I sort of, I was wondering, shall I tell you? There's another photograph that shows that to the left, there's a fireplace. And so, I suppose this is London in the 60s, soot. You know, there was a partition, and one room got dirty. And then in the early 70s, uh, 70s again, late 60s or 70s, so you can see, you know, you'd be forgiven for not knowing that these are the finest 18th century interiors in London. And this one, which is perhaps one of my favorites because of its kind of pathos, and also because I, I kind of recognize some of this from my childhood in the 70s. Um, I didn't grow up in England, so it's interesting to be the new English. 
I guess, I guess we are the new English. Um, but I used to come to England a lot to visit um, our family. And in the 70s, I have this sort of memory that this is what it was kind of like, the radio set, the bedspread. But these are, this is a section through the two buildings. It's, um, there were silk mercers on the ground floor. They would do business on the first floor. They would live on the second floor, and then servants in the basement and attic. The top floor is new, is 1970s, is after the fire. And our job started, <coughs> really, it was to add two new galleries at the back of the building, um, to the right of the, of the um, Georgian building, and to excavate below the office building on the right to get enough ceiling height for new gallery spaces. So to some extent, it started off as a, almost like an engineering project, propping up that building on the right and to place two new contemporary galleries, one top lit in the middle and one side lit at the end, and then to try and reconstruct some kind of idea of the city, of the, the city block by entering here and then having a view straight through even though your path is rather meandering. The first floor is very typical, front room, back room and two stairs. The second floor is rather special, it's got these very, very thin screens between what was the sort of the laundry area, the storage area and then the main living room. And then the third floor is more or less entirely new and the, f um, the fourth floor too, the roof space. Frying Pan Alley down the back, the white building is the one that needs to be propped up. Um, a bit of 1972. This may have been caused the cause of the fire, but we're not sure. The construction. And then it really became about designing this new gallery space, this new white cube for, for contemporary art. And getting a staircase down to it from the original ground floor into the basement. And then I suppose this is sort of London building. It's like kind of dentistry. Uh, just picking there you can see the kind of the frame that held the building up while um, the excavation happened and then it was dropped onto new footings. It's kind of messy. And then one of the, I find one of the most fantastic parts of projects, particularly in, in the UK, is the moment when they get plastered. That this bonding plaster, which has this sort of pinky brown texture, turns every project momentarily into a cave. And it's sort of like it's like surrounded by mud and it's, it's only in the UK that I think they use this. And it's a sort of very special part. But anyway, it became the white cube, uh, as one would expect. And this is, this is the space, top lit with those two light cannons. But perhaps the most interesting part of the project came really when, not so much when we were making a new building at the back of the 18th century building, but when the world of the contemporary art, the white world, starts moving back into the 18th century, when all of the 18th century becomes white and becomes part of contemporary art, especially when remembering the blackness of this image, that suddenly black goes to white. And this process of iteration somehow becomes the subject of the project. Here's a detail of it. And Takashi, who was um, uh, one of the working, collaborating with us on this project all the way through, um, showed us this photograph from um, his parents' hometown in, in Japan and said, look, you know, charred wood is not just destruction, it's, it's a building material. And of course, one of the great things about charred wood is it doesn't, it's very good fire pr protection. It doesn't burn a second time. So we started to look at using this technique on the roof. Um, some experiments, Takesh kind of blowtorch in, in our courtyard burning things. Of course, you can't get anywhere near the heat necessary with a blowtorch. And he went back to, to Japan and found out how you did it traditionally, which is to make a chimney of three pieces of cedar. A chimney, so a triangular chimney, prop it up on the brick. I think traditionally would have had straw on the inside, but in our case, newspaper. And then you light it. And then it burns like an absolute inferno. It sounds like a jet engine. I was taking these photographs with a stopwatch to get the perfect sort of cook on the inside. And Tack was like, no, 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 just watch. And then as the surface is burnt away, it comes through the edges, burns the binding, and then falls over. It's incredibly elegant process. It's about two or three minutes. Uh, 
The guy in the suit is the contractor, is we're on his farm, and he, at this point, very confused. Um, and then this was the, you could say, the mass production, once the technique was perfected. You can see on the left, some of the chimneys made. On the, in the middle, they're propped up. I would say this is one of those things where, if we are going to be modern, this is a really modern space. It's a traditional Japanese technique in a farm in Hertfordshire being carried out by Lithuanian builders. Um, and this is it. This is the kind of the vents and the, it's the ventilation, the lighting um, of the galleries. And there is one of the rooms that burnt down. So they sort of stand outside like kind of little mementos of the fire. And this idea of texture and time and uh, wear and tear suddenly appeared everywhere in the project. We're in the 18th century shop in number 58, but it's got a bit of 1970s concrete in it, really bad English concrete, but a kind of an incredible texture. And so that was kept. And so the idea of the, the old and the new, the original, which you can't find, of course, because the building's been transformed over and over and over again um, in the 250 years it's been standing there, never really became possible. So it was just about layers, about different textures. And the staircase became this big thing, this sort of the idea of what kind of stair do you make. And in the end, we became interested in some of the techniques, sort of Georgian techniques. And it was to make a cantilevered stair, like a traditional Georgian stone cantilevered stair, but in precast concrete. And this is the company. I like it when sign writers mark their shop with sign writing on the glass and precast concrete, do it in precast. And um, fantastic kind of white concrete, incredibly precise process, which the guy doing it, when we were talking about the iris that you put on concrete to stop it chipping, you know, drawing these little radii, he basically put the silicon in the mold and just ran his finger along it. So it's like a kind of extruded fingertip. And here they are. This is one of the most wonderful bits of building. Um, it's all quite miraculous how it stands up. You just pop it in 100 millimeters into the wall and then just keep going and just keep stacking them on a kind of dry, dry bed, about a millimeter, two millimeters thick. And then it stands, it just holds. And then we wanted to respond to the original staircase, which is this one from the kind of mid 18th century. And it's great swoosh at the bottom to say that I've arrived. In a gallery, you can't really do that. Um, you need to be visually quite um, subdued or quite, um, quite under, underplayed. But I think your fingertips can start doing it. So we started looking at ways in which the kind of handrail could just sort of end with a little, a little handshake. Another borrowed detail, this in fact is from our son's primary school. It's at the bottom of the front door. I always liked it and then we got to use it again here. So this is the castings and the kind of the idea of castings as having a memory. This is uh, cast against sand and it's sort of got this sort of texture um, which runs then throughout the project as a kind of, you know, if this project is sort of about memory or reconstituting memory, casting seems to be the way to go. And even right down into the <coughs> door furniture, this is actually a copy of a doorknob from number 14 Bedford Square. From a, that dates me in the school, when, when the school had some studios over there. And it's basically a copy of that with a fingerprint pressed into it, um, recast. And then thresholds, you know, door handles, handrails, are all to do with these thresholds. And this bit when the Georgian goes into the contemporary was a particularly difficult um, uh, geometry to reconcile. It's the only bit where we, in fact, where we use rhino. I think the process is called lofting, where the kind of the rectangle, <laughs> that's a Georgian term. Um, okay, the laugh comes from a certain age group, I know that. Um, basically, to just try and morph the flattened arch of the Georgians into the rectangle um, of our own time. And it was just the most fantastic. Um, uh, these guys who do sort of basically ornamental plaster just sort of built it, made a few sections, got the model, made a few sections. And it's like a kind of infinity cove in a, in a photographer's studio. But it's also like um, a bit of vaulting, plastered vaulting in the entrance. So it's almost like a kind of non-threshold. 
And this story of plaster kind of carries on. This is the first floor. This is a very, very rare example of a um, plaster ceiling carved in situ. So before these, this is from about 1754, they were more often in papier mache because lime plaster was too soft or, or took too long to cure. And then some guy in Paris in the 1750s put some gypsum into lime, mixed it up, and it, it became firm. And then they did a couple of these, and then very soon after that, they get so good at it, they start casting, and ornamentation becomes cast. So it's a very unusual one that's got the softness of a kind of handmade thing. And it's from that room on the top left, a sort of the, the darker gray one. And this is that room in 1914, another photograph um, from, from that archive. 1914, it's June 1914. Brett and I were just having a conversation about the domino structure, uh, Corbusier's domino structure, which was drawn in November 1914. I mean, just think of what happened between June and November of that year. <laughs> um, and it's a really in interesting date, um, given that it might be when we became modern. It's certainly when we learned how to really destroy ourselves. Um, it's also more or less the time when uh, Duchamp starts making the large glass. It's when Wittgenstein is on the front writing the Tractatus. It's the most extraordinary few years. Anyway, immediately after the First World War, 1920, um, and here I'm, this is conjecture, when Britain was broke but had a hell of a lot of history and America was very rich and had relatively little history, they shipped the whole room to America. And I think this one and many others, they took it out as a whole prefabricated set and it went to the Chicago uh, Art Institute. And um, we basically, through a very circuitous route, we managed to find it. And this is the first case in, I think, 2008, 2007, of the room coming back, um, unpacking it, kind of Rococo in bubble wrap. There's no instructions to this stuff. <laughs> um, and then while the building is being built, you know, this kind of contemporary building is being built on one end of the building, then there's a sort of the process of reconstituting this very strange um, event. And then I think the dark in this image is what we found in the boxes, and the light was remade to, to complete it. But basically all the good stuff, all the, carve, all the carvings were there, and it was a kind of completely extraordinary parallel process. Um, it coming back, it went to Brighton again to be, to be fixed. I mean, this room has traveled. Um, of course, in 80 years while it's away, I mean, London moves. You know, London's on clay, and it didn't fit. Um, so it had to be retrimmed and recut uh, to come back in. But that's it now. The room is now known as, sort of informally, as Chicago. We never found the fireplace, but somehow that seems appropriate now. And of course, it's the only 18th century interior in the building because it was a way for the fire. Um, so it has a sort of a very particular kind of presence in the whole story. These ones are all 1972, in concrete and panelling included. So this is a little walk around the building, kind of going from the contemporary back in. And this is one of the shows at Raven Row. It's a, a piece by Alice Shannon, and it's basically castings of smoke rings. And I thought, wow, when I saw it, you know, God, do we just kind of, are these ley lines or something? Um, because that's the space that it's in. Um, but, of course, we had a client and a curator who knew all these stories, and it was placed. Um, but I think it's, you know, the way that these stories sort of return on themselves is, is kind of the subject. It's a great space for very kind of intimate work, like video work. It's mainly video work and, um, and installations. At the moment, it's a maze. You can't see any of these rooms. It's a sort of Stephen Willett's kind of strange interior. But anyway, the other part of the building, which disappeared, is the cast iron on the top of the facade, which was stolen in the, seven, in, in the late 60s. Um, and it, that became another part of the reconstituting of the building. So the rear facade, where we made the new galleries, we decided that had to be cast iron. And um, 
you know, extraordinary process, heat, heat, heat. Um, and it became a casting of, of course, the burnt timber. Um, the burnt timber, far too fragile to take it off the roof and have it on an alleyway, but the cast iron can sort of, can do it. And that's the, the kind of the back elevation now. It's called Frying Pan Alley, uh, appropriately enough. And this is the view through from the back alley right the way through to the front. Carrying on with cast iron, being the kind of background of London, we did another cast iron project more recently in Albemarle Street in Mayfair for Paul Smith. More or less the same process, the same foundry in Essex, uh, but this time with, a, you could say, a kind of more, a more decorative take on the context. It's actually a timber door <coughs> inside cast iron, but the whole, the whole facade was... It's a new facade for um, below a 1980s kind of neo-Georgian building. And when, um, when we spoke to Paul Smith about it, when we were doing the competition, we just said, cast iron is the background of London. It's, it's the manhole covers for drainage. It's the decorative. Um, it's the balconies. Um, it's everything. It, this kind of suits you. And um, he went for this. is one of his drawings on the bottom left of a cat. That's what you can do with castings. But of course, these shapes aren't ours. They're sort of from, I suppose, vaguely from textiles. But there are very few shapes. There are very few patterns. This is actually on John Street, where um, the AA used to have a studio. And interlocking circles is one of the oldest patterns around. So these things sort of are permanently repeating themselves, or we're permanently repeating ourselves. And this idea of kind of the, the, the pattern making of textiles that becomes metalwork, this idea that sort of comes again in a show we did at Raven Row. We did. We helped design. It was a show um, curated by Alex Sainsbury and um, of the collection of Seth Siegelau, a textile show. This is Seth Siegelau, who's been one of the pioneers of um, conceptual art in the late 60s in New York with with shows with people like Corsuth and Lawrence Wiener and all of that lot. In the 70s, he abandoned conceptual art you know, completely abruptly and disappeared into uh, blaming, you could say, the market economy when all these artists started having careers and fame and galleries. Um, he basically wanted, he was interested in the collective, in them just producing work, not in careers. So he disappeared, he did lots of other things, but then started collecting textiles, which he considered to be the most fundamental human activity. It is the one thing that binds agriculture with law, with class, with religion. It's the sort of fundamental human act. And accumulated an extraordinary collection of textiles and would never show them, except when he found out that Raven Row was actually built for Huguenot silk with mercers. And then it became okay. So his, um, since the building was for textiles, built by textile makers, he would show his collection. And these are it's 18th century Italian um, and French silks, which of course were banned in England when the buildings were built. Spitalfield's wealth really came from the, um, the monopoly that they had on the English silk market. And so there was this kind of Homecoming, this idea, of, you know, and textiles sort of recurring. Um, and that leads on to the sort of next project. This is a measured drawing of a loom, and it's a project with the students um, in ETH, and it was really testing out Seth's kind of theory that everything comes back to textiles. And we looked at the map of Europe of textile centers, uh, Huddersfield, Manchester, Lyon, you know, the, all the usual ones, and suddenly the same size. There was a city called Forst on, in eastern Germany. I'd never heard of it. Every other town I'd heard of, and it's still a big town, but this one not. And so we wondered what had happened. We asked German people. Nobody had really heard of it. And we went in search for it. It's on the German-Polish border. This is a sort of trade map. It was the second biggest textile center in Germany in the 19th century. And we basically made a measured, a measured drawing or an atlas of measured drawings of this city, which is disappearing, where it basically switched off in the 20th century. 
These are sort of time maps looking at the 19th century, post-war, now. And then there was a series of photographs that the students took, which were doppelgangers. This is an archive photograph from the late 30s. This is it now. This is, I think, 1942, um, uh, looking across the river, three girls on a bench, and the bridge on the right-hand side. This is it now. Interestingly, the bench somehow has remained. Um, and then, so the project was really about um, looking at what happens to, um, to cities, post-industrial cities, and maybe this is kind of, um, this is kind of Europe in extremis. It's, it's happening everywhere, but in this case, it has a certain visceral and urgency. These are drawings of railways that went through the town, waterways that gave the power for the mills, um, gardens that have been um, built. This is, this is the city. You can see in the foreground there's a little bit of foundation. There was a whole city there. How quickly nature just comes back as soon as humans go. Um, it's quite extraordinary. These kind of natural history drawings looking at natural seeding on rubble. And then the students then speculated on projects. It was like a kind of um, uh, a, a retrofit garden city, effectively. Uh, these kind of rather strange collages. This one I like, the Plattenbauer, reflected as a cottage in a kind of vaguely sort of constable kind of way. These energy landscapes, which is really that region of Germany, which absolutely just consume the landscape and are coming. It's a little the kind of strip at the top, they just move in a linear way and then the, if what they normally do is they relocate a whole town um, in order to get the coal, but his students were suggesting transforming it into a kind of little lakeside town. And this is another picture of one of the, one of the mills. There were 400 mills in this town, 400 of these, um, and now there are none apart from these ruins. And I think that this notion of the kind of ruin has re-emerged really strongly over the last, um, over the last few years. Um, and there's a show opening up at Tate Britain, I think, in, in April, which is about ruins, the use of ruins in contemporary art. And I don't think it's anything to do really with um, a kind of return to the 19th century romantic imagination. I think it's a kind of call to arms that maybe one of the fault lines in modernism is it anticipated growth, but it never anticipated decay. And that, that you could say, has been an, our undoing. And that ruins remind us that with growth, with production, will one day come decay and decline. And that maybe we need to um, pay more attention to them. And that leads to one of the great images of ruins from only half a mile away from the Soane Museum. Um, Soane's Bank of England, uh, represented by Gandhi as a ruin, and in his imagination it was the sort of the most exalted form of architecture, architecture beyond humans, beyond program, beyond use, beyond time. Um, kind of amazing thing, but how prescient he was, this is actually the Bank of England. Um, and it's not a wartime image. This is 1925. This is actually when they demolished the middle of the Bank of England. When I first saw this image, I, I assumed this is one of these classic London post-war images, but it's not. It's kind of purposeful and deliberate. And of course, <coughs> another example that we have so few shapes. 1970, uh, Gordon Matta Clark also, I suppose, they were also having their ecological crisis in 1971-72 and the idea of the ruin. So we started sort of examining that more. This is a section through the Soane Museum and decided that we would build with the students a replica of the amazing picture gallery and Monk's Parlour, which is the right-hand side of the image in, um, in Zurich. Um, so this is the, the fantastic picture gallery uh, with its folding panels. And this is it rebuilt in Zurich. He did do the grand tour to Italy. We know that. He met Piranesi, and I don't think he ever went to Switzerland, but he has now. Um, this is rebuilt again in two weeks by the students. 
Um, it was timber that was a contractor gave us. It had been a hoarding, which is why it's red. Um, but we thought that seemed fa faintly appropriate for Soane. And then, of course, when you strip an interior out from the middle of the city block into being a freestanding tower, all sorts of inventions happen. And therefore, it becomes its own thing. And even the staircase there going up on the right-hand side is actually 96 hands reused. So it's a sort of cannibalization of lots of different structures. Um, we weren't allowed to borrow the Hogarths or the Pyrenees, um, so we painted them in gloss onto, onto the thing to suggest where they might go. And then on the inside, we put the drawings and images of the Sone Museum so you would understand where you are. And I suppose that this is part of the idea of the mimetics, the copy being a kind of one step away <coughs> that takes us to Churchill College in Cambridge, um, which is another kind of copy. It's a project we're doing at the moment. Hopefully it will start on site um, this summer. Um, or, or in autumn, probably. Um, and it's a courtyard building. This is the original sh uh, Shepherd Robson uh, uh, courtyard, of which there are 10 that make up the college. And we decided that we would make just another one. We would basically do a doppelganger. Um, the white one is our project. It's a kind of brick and concrete, um, often called brutalist, but it's not really brutalist. It's sort of picturesque, brutalist. But our project would be organic as opposed to mineral. The original is uh, brickwork, kind of earthy and concrete, and so we would just go the other way and go kind of fibrous and organic. Um, we would articulate the story heights like the original one, but in these kind of thin cuts where the building sort of bends just to, to bring a kind of slight curvature to the square where the um, courtyard is basically empty or one tree, ours is going to have a birch forest in it. Um, and so it goes for the plan. There's the rooms face inwards and outwards. In ours, only bedrooms only face outwards and the common parts face inwards like a kind of cloister. So the social spaces uh, turn inwards. And then um, the timber, which is going to be oak, it's a reclaimed oak, of course, it does rhyme with concrete. It isn't the opposite of concrete. Um, it will be dark, a dark reclaimed oak thing. Exposed structure, like the original, lots of sort of quite muscular concrete will be um, all exposed um, timber structure. And, of course, concrete has always been timber anyway. Um, except when it's wanting to be brick. And this is a project um, we're doing at the moment. It's uh, starting on site in West London. It's a studio for the photographer Jürgen Teller um, in, um, in West London, in a kind of industrial, former industrial site. Very, very long, thin building. And I guess it, you could call it sort of slightly Arsonian building. It's 60 meters long, seven meters wide, and you go from street through building interiors, top-lit interiors, into garden, courtyards, into an interior, into a courtyard, and uh, gradually sort of going away from the street into a completely internalized world, of which is just really light coming from the top, <coughs> and then his pictures, and then the next garden. So it sort of kind of goes on forever in a sort of slightly Sonian, Sonian way. It keeps some elements of party walls and you could say the sort of the debris of a kind of London site. And it's in a sense, it's a sort of very concentrated version of a project um, that we did that was opened in 2010 for the South London Gallery in Peckham, of which this is the education studio, um, which is again a series of sort of gardens and interiors that make a kind of sweep or campus. Um, this is the interior of the education room and the, uh, the original gallery is the big building on the kind of right-hand side of the slide with the big roof light behind Camberwell College on Peckham Road. This is the, the interior, one of, one of the really great gallery spaces in London built in the late 19th century. Um, but the problem with it uh, was that they only have 
the big, great gallery space. So they had amazing shows, really groundbreaking art program, but they couldn't do anything else, even though they were having sort of education programs, residencies. This is the kind of the, the college that was built in front of the building at the turn of the century. And the council had given this little modest uh, Victorian terraced house to the gallery on condition that they refurbished it. They had started demolishing it and then stopped. We're not entirely sure why. But basically, it was really done for. And most people advised that it would be a lot cheaper to just get rid of it and start again. But the client, Margot Heller, the, the, the director, was sort of really insistent that the domesticity was its kind of raison d'être. So we put a lot of effort into refurbishing the house, then building a new building behind it and an ed education studio, and then trying to fit it all in, stitch it all back together within a kind of fairly unruly South London backs. These were some of the models of the kind of link space between the main gallery and the house, so domestic in some forms, but then very grand in others. And the plan um, of the whole thing, the only one that I suppose that's important here is the bottom one, in that there's that new education suite at the back of the building that is a project that we in sort of inherited from a previous architect. And this project is really about collaboration. So this end building being the new one um, that had to be built. The gallery never closed during the project. So there were permanently, a permanent program of exhibitions, which were often to do with the building. And this is Chris Burden's uh, show. And they wanted to put another Chris Burden piece, the American conceptual artist, which is the flying steamroller which is the most extraordinary piece. It's on a, it's on a kind of balancing arm. It, they drive it around, and then they pull a lever, and it basically just lifts and glides for about, I think, nine minutes. Steamroller just going round and round silently in circles. Very, very beautiful thing. And they wanted to put it in the back garden. This is the radius of the steamroller. So we were working with them, helping them produce some of these shows. And it fit, more or less. Um, except that if you walked out at the wrong moment, <laughs> that, would be, that would be the end of it. So anyway, it happened in the um, parade ground outside Chelsea College of Art near Tate Britain. But nevertheless, that drawing sort of pointed to a space. It sort of said, you know, this, the circle saying, we are here. And we kind of, more or less simultaneously, or around about the same time, we found this archive drawing of um, interwar archive drawing which showed that there wasn't one gallery, there were two galleries. You see on the top left, that's not there anymore. And that they always had a second um, big space. So we kind of, um, and of course it's really explained, this is an OS map from 1947. And I don't know if you can read from where you are, but beside the gallery, which is where the circle is, you can see the word ruin. And if you kind of make a sort of, a, extended circle upwards next to the, ch the chapel, there's ruin, 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 and effectively you can work out where the bomb landed. These maps are quite extraordinary in the way that they tell these stories. So anyway, the building was lost after the war, but we decided with the client that it would be more interesting not to demolish anything, but just to rebuild in the footprint of this former building. And that's, those are the kind of the models um, also keeping the kind of the lantern, which was the motif of the, f of the original gallery as a sort of centerpiece. So then the, the project sort of took that shape. This is London. Everything has to come in as kind of basically as sticks. Um, it all has to go through the front door or through that front window. So steel and sticks. Um, but still the kind of, and then the bonding plaster. So we basically reconstructed the house, but without its details. So it's like a kind of ghost of a Victorian house. Elements that, that were outside at the top became inside. And then this is an installation, drawings that we made for an installation by the Brazilian artist, um, Ravani Neuschwander, which were going on simultaneously. Uh, the cheapest way of making a false floor in the building for her, for her piece of kind of light and dark. And it, it was sort of interesting that we never really worked out whether our building was like her installation or her installation was like our building. 
but it seems like every place has its own way to, way to build. And in South London, there's a kind of, uh, I suppose, a certain kind of unruliness um, of timber, brick, bit of stone, um, some steel. And then the exhibition program even came into the building site. This is uh, the source of life. The source of art is in the life of the people is the sort of the motto of the gallery below the original floor, a kind of very Victorian kind of um, moral message, uh, which an artist then put on the, on the um, hard hat, and then the builders became the sort of the artwork. And interestingly, they were absolutely delighted. They thought it was absolutely brilliant that people were coming to watch them. Um, <laughs> And then this is the kind of the, the, the building site, the sort of, I suppose, the messiness of it all. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you're meant to stand on your neighbor's roof. Um, this is it all going up, a sort of timber frame with some bits of brick, some bits of steel. It's a very kind of heterogeneous construction. I hope no, nobody from health and safety here. Um, <laughs> This is the, and this is the forming of this kind of new building at the back um, that was just being lifted into place. And then, again, more collaboration with the contractor, amazing contractor uh, called John Perkins. And we were, we were cladding the building in Eternit, very cheap material. Um, you know, the project is kind of low budget, but we didn't want their horrible clips, these kind of plastic clips. And we thought, could we not do something nice in metal like like you have on a pen that holds it in your pocket. And then John went, yep, I can do that. And then just sort of got somebody to make these. And they're very nice little kind of um, uh, sweet details. So this is, you've got the client, you've got artists, you've got um, uh, the contractor kind of all playing as well as the history of the place. Um, all the surfaces that you could touch and manipulate were made in timber. Uh, painted timber so they could do kind of wear and tear. So these are ones that can kind of get bashed. The first show, which was great, was um, wall drawings. So very kind of appropriate for a new building. David Shrigley um, doing um, quite, a, quite a dark joke, pardon the pun, um, about being in Peckham, a gallery in Peckham. Uh, Dan Prochowski with wall drawings. And then this is coming from the education room back towards the building. And it's a sort of, you know, it's not unlike that world, that irregular world of, of uh, Monsieur Hulot, uh, which of course is the one that's full of life, you know, compared with the sort of the slightly anxious world of um, his sister and brother-in-law. Little reference to Giri at the top, I suppose, um, his early works in Santa Monica, the kind of the exposed frame as the roof garden. And then another, piece, the foundation stone of the project, which is this little kind of crescent shape of concrete, um, which was one of the artists during the process had been casting the threshold of the original gallery. And um, our contractor had helped him with the casting. He wasn't brilliant at concrete. And um, John <coughs> couldn't bear to watch it, so he got involved. And then they ended up coming back into the project. So a few people have said to me, oops, your concrete went wrong. Um, it's not, it's art. Inside the building, it was more or less entirely rebuilt with um, some quite little, nice little adjustments, this handrail which goes past the chimney breast um, and then forming a kind of a new, a new stair and having to find new shapes that could, could get that. We never look up on the underside of handrails when we're designing them, but we always do when we go upstairs. That's what we do, we look up. And this... Mikey, who was the, the carpenter on the job, didn't like our crude detail, so he made this, which is, I think, just so sweet. He didn't ask, of course he wouldn't. Um, he just did it, and um, it's one of those very nice things when you, the project kind of sort of belongs to others. This is one of our projects, one of our drawings of the stair, which is then being, which we found on site, which was being used by Gary Woodley, one of the artists in the first show, to set out his own drawings. So the kind of this, the project's not even finished, and it's already been, even our drawings are being re-inhabited by others, yet alone the building. Um, the, the rooms were left unfinished for Ernst Caramel to do his wall paintings. 
Victorian joinery um, and another wall drawing. The big, the sort of the garden room as it's now called, um, the link space between all of these old and new bits was formed um, and with a lot of effort going on to the left hand wall as being the kind of ultimate art wall. Um, I think it's about seven meters tall, it's about six or seven meters long. It has no emergency exit signs, no plugs, no light switches. It's perfect for art. Of course, Paul Morrison then chose the other one um, <coughs> that did have an emergency exit sign and an and a intruder alarm and um, all the stuff, which of course is where the life is. I mean, it's not surprising that he picked the, the, wall, the walls with life. And this is a piece that he did for the show, which um, is in gold leaf. It's actually real gold leaf. And there was um, um, a specialist from Berlin came over to, uh, to install it. And she was up on the scaffolding, putting it in, as the building was finishing. And I arrived, I can't remember, it was some sort of snagging, some sort of building works issue. And then she just yelled at me. She said, get out of my space, I'm working. And I kind of yelled up, it's not your space, it's my space. Um, and I think after about four and a half years, you get quite proprietorial. You sort of <laughs> and, but of course, she was right. And it's that point when it's kind of devastating as an architect that the moment it's good or the moment you feel like you've done what you've done, you, it goes. It's somebody else's. Um, and this was a tem you know, temporary show, like all exhibitions. But this piece has become permanent. It sort of it became absorbed into the architecture so quickly that now people just assume it was commissioned with the building and all the rest of it. And so it's sort of great that these, these sort of accidents kind of happen. And I just wanted to end really with, you know, that that's all we ever do is make spaces where we come together, hand them over and come together. But just to finish with, there was one last bit about Raven Row I didn't mention, which was that while we were doing the project, when we got to the building and the client bought the building, in the top floor, there was um, a flat where Hannah and Rebecca Levy lived. Um, you'll recognize from the name that they were Jewish. They were sisters, and they'd lived in the building since the 1920s. So more or less when that room is being stripped out and taken to America. So kind of, and they had the oldest protected tenancy in the UK. And when Alex Sainsbury bought the building, um, it came with tenants, with these responsibilities. It's grade one listed and tenants. And um, they, were, they never married. They, never, um, they didn't have any close family. And uh, there was no lift in the building. Uh, and Alex basically sort of took on um, responsibility for their welfare. And initially, he offered them sheltered accommodation, where there would be care, where there would be lifts, um, easier access. And they just turned around to Alex and went, no, we're only planning one more move. Um, <laughs> and um, the thing that became really, and anyway, they stayed all the way through the project. Sadly, Hannah died just before building work started, and Rebecca um, stayed all the way through. But because there were two buildings and two staircases, we could more or less make it work. And it was the first time there'd been built people in the building for decades, so they were delighted, and the builders fixed the lino in the kitchen and kind of looked after them. Um, but then a friend of mine was looking, saw some of these archive photographs, and I had never made this connection, but this is from the 60s. This building doesn't exist anymore. This is before the fire, and that piece of furniture is still there. Um, and suddenly it made us think, wow, they are in their 90s. They have, their lives is more than a third of the life of this building. And it just really was a kind of a pause for thought between the lives of people and the lives of the city, which are, in fact, really very similar. Thank you very much. much. Fantastic talk. Um, a million and one questions. We, I mean, and I'll open up to the floor in a minute just, just to settle in after the talk. I'm wondering if, if you might say something about um, the, the incredible breadth of photography in the work. It's, 
it's interesting that beyond just the way, like an architect will, in this room especially, show pictures of projects and use the photograph as a kind of document, what's, what's astonishing is the many different ways that the photograph seems to operate within the studio, not just in the archival sense, which you come to again beautifully at the end of the talk, and or, or let's say in working unbelievably with a, a client like Teller, <coughs> who's a modern master of the, of the medium, but, but that it almost becomes the device by which you can, can operate in this interesting space you, you mentioned early on in a kind of latent memory instead of a precedent. And I'm just wondering how conscious the photograph or the role of photography might be in the studio on a kind of daily, very sort of ordinary basis, if it's something you all think about or talk about or reflect upon. Um, well, it's, it's a really interesting question because I haven't been asked it before, but it's, there are two, I mean, there are several people who are really important to our practice. You mentioned Richard Wentworth, um, the artist, um, but there are also kind of um, colleagues our age we went to college with one of them is the photographer David Grandorch, who I was at university with. In fact, I was there when he started taking photographs. So I would say that there are two, in a sense, there are two photographic traditions at work. There's one which is really coming from Dusseldorf and um, this sort of very objective, yeah. upright kind of, um, the photographer is not there, it's just an image, um, which is really where David Grandorch, who took quite a lot of these photographs, he took this one, in fact, quite a lot of the photographs. And then there's a tradition, which is the kind of Richard Wentworth one, which is the snatched moments, which really comes more from um, documentary and you know people like um, Eugène Agé and people like that. So there is a kind of, um, yeah, there is a kind of self-consciousness about how powerful pictures can be, um, you know, like finding this, box of archive photographs. None of this would have happened if somebody hadn't yeah. taken those photographs, or it would have happened very differently. And, um, and those photographs, one of the, uh, the things that makes them so, um, I don't know, maybe kind of uh, resilient, is the quality of the photographs. You know, these were not amateurs, because we were wondering, you know, is this a kind of an insurance executive coming to record the fire, you know, uh, working out what to pay? It's not, this is a plate camera with perspective correction, um, it's been, somebody has spent half a day taking this photograph. And that is prob probably what makes a photograph so mysterious, is that they are so careful. And I think that the, I think we, we're not wanting some kind of too self-conscious, we, we do look at the pictures that we make, that um, the, the pictures that we fund, and then, um, and I suppose that they do, we do maybe kind of try and use both the, the sort of documentary tradition of Richard, which is often to do with, um, you could call them sort of visual puns or the association between how two things come together in space, um, very often accidentally, and then how things are very deliberately composed in a kind of much more sort of formal standoffish. But these, the pictures I showed, some of them are, well, archive photos, quite a few by David, quite a few are uh, mine, quite a few, I think, are Takish's, Steph's, um, and people in the studio. But I think, yes, I think there is, we never really talk about it, but I think there is a certain carefulness. The other thing that seems to open up, and you, you did it with, with during the talk, is of, of course the, the, the sort of frame that's being captured to describe the project is a very long one. It's interesting mm. that you kind of go back, not just during construction, as it's completed, but that it plays out over, a, in effect, a future that could still become part of that description. You can go back now and show what happens several years later. And it, you know, the idea that time becomes a huge part of the project is something that, Absolutely. in the book, seems to be an important. Yeah, I mean, I think that, the, 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 in a sense, the passage of time is, mm. I think, especially when you're working in London, you can't avoid it. The, um, the studio for Jürgen Teller was, on paper, when we started it, a brand new building. Mm -hmm really like absolutely this is a and we were sort of thinking great no history you know ah, no archives none of this just a new building and then we suddenly realized that there was a wall going down to, to, that was part of the, the old building that we were going to demolish and we went looked over the wall and the neighbors had illegally built all these sheds against it so although it's his wall to demolish you're not going to make friends it's his right to demolish it but suddenly you realize well you know, again, time has done its thing. People have 
lived against it. And so it's legally his wall, but kind of emotionally it's not his wall. It's a shared wall. And so we decided, well, we'll keep it. And then that set up a whole series of other issues, and now it looks like we're going to keep using more bits now that the demolition is going to start. So I suppose that's what I meant at the beginning. There is almost impossible to be new, um, and there's always some kind of depth of history that, or some kind of event that precedes you. Sometimes it's visible, sometimes not. Questions? Hi. Um, yeah, I was sort of struck by that when you mentioned the, uh, when you showed the image of the, the, the burnt out interior of, of Raven Row and then, and then the sort of the white painted version of those same details and, and sort of talking about how that had made it contemporary. Um, and I was trying to think, I was, I was sort of thinking about the, the notion of, um, you know, why, why is the contemporary white um, and wondering whether there's a way of looking at it in terms of actually it's less contemporary when you've painted it over because of course in, in one sense not painting over it means you're seeing it as it actually is now mm. and it becoming white is actually uh, um, in some ways creating the history because it's actually making it a ghost. Um, those are just some of my musings. I was, I was just sort of wondering if you, if, if you had any more elaboration on that notion of, of, of making something contemporary by sort of freezing it in a whiteness. Well, I mean, one way of answering maybe is sort of by telling the truth um, about actually what happened. After the fire, the building was rebuilt um, quite carefully by a, a res restoration architect whose name slightly escapes me. Anyway, Benson, that's it. Thanks, Takesh. Um, and so the building, as you see it, that white room, was, is actually 1972, 73. Um, so we didn't rebuild it. It was rebuilt. We just found completely separately the, the image of the burnt one. So that's kind of one thing, is that the, you know it wasn't our job. We weren't trying to restore it. We were we had it as found. The other thing was, is that it's a gallery space. Um, and that, to some extent, you could say is pointing, maybe not, maybe pointing is the wrong word, but you know, that was not discussed with the client. You know, it is going to be a white space. And in fact, it's not always white. Sometimes it's painted for shows, but it's, its background is white. In fact, it's a color that's called not totally white. Um, <laughs> it's got a slightly train spottery project. Um, but um, I think the point I was trying to make was normally, um, normally the way that w the projects sort of exert their influence is from the past through into the present, into the future. So you are influenced by something that happened before. What seemed to happen there was we were making this white cube and suddenly we were in this Rococo interiors and they were starting to behave like um, like con contemporary art spaces, but they had all this decoration, all this kind of carvings, these pediments, architraves, and you kind of thought, what a strange thing to happen to these. I mean, this is not the future that these spaces thought they were going to have when they were built. And we, in fact, we did paint analysis of the, um, the building, and you could see almost the, the taste. It's like a stratification of taste. Um, we repainted the facade a kind of stone color the, the shop front, which is the really, really precious bit. You know, it's the bit that Pevsner describes as the finest Georgian shop front in London. And it was when we started, I think it was dark green, it has been dark brown, you know, the colors you see around Spitalfields. And we did the paint analysis and it turned out that that stone color was the original color. And if you were really fancy, you did your facade in Portland stone if you were quite fancy, which these guys were, you did it in timber and painted it like stone, so it would probably have been veined even. The steps are Portland stone. And then if you were less fancy, you would then have done it in stucco, et cetera, et cetera. So the kind of the whole idea of color is sort of really has a very striking 
kind of a temporal association. You know, so suddenly all these interiors going white just made them, as you say, ghost-like, very strange. Um, and that's, I suppose that's the bit where, for us, that became interesting was the, this, this idea that the stories or the narratives go in both directions, that it's not a linear thing where you have old stuff over there and, and new stuff over here. It sort of folds over itself. And then we had to find somehow maybe a new way of working which was sort of accepted it. Like you, I'm an architect uh, blessed to have grown up in a family of art historians. My mom, decorative arts, Victorian painting, my stepfather, American um, art. How did this environment contribute to your journey towards becoming an architect? I have to be very careful here. The, this environment is <laughs> looking at me right now. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not sure because uh, there's more than my biography <coughs> in here. There's, there's Steph. I would say one, the, the possibly some of the important things are <laughs> that Steph is a Londoner and I'm not. I mean, I am now. I would consider myself uh, to be a Londoner now, but I'm, I, I, I'm not from London. I, wasn't, I was born in France. I grew up in Belgium. Um, Steph is from South London, absolutely. So there are, and then from that point, there are very, very different trajectories. Um, I came from, you could say, a fairly academic background. My mother's a historian. My father's an economist. Um, quite a bookish family. Uh, quite, uh, you know, quite a lot of culture, a lot of exhibitions, a lot of churches and summer holidays. Battlefields of France, you know, that's, that's sort of, um, I can tell you what the weather was on the Battle of Waterloo. Um, and um, yes, it does. You know, I, you know I, as, as a teenager, I was probably sort of a bit kind of all elbows and not very responsive. But I think that, um, but later on, you realize that it's sort of, that these, tr I suppose one of the things I am interested in is not being a historian. That as an architect, I have a completely different space to my mother. My mother has to be rigorous and has to say, tell the truth. I'm, we're architects and we can invent things. So I would say that that's, that's an important difference. But also, you know, Steph's biography is an art school biography. You know, she went, uh, left school early, went, went to art school, and then through, well, the way our lives work, she ended up in architecture school. I just went straight in, in first year, you know. Um, so I would say that it's probably, it's more complex than, um, than one set of circumstances. But certainly I think that, you know, I think if I'd grown up in a family of, I don't know, bankers or dancers, w it would have been a very different environment. I mean, you know, history and art history was really a big, it was a big, um, it was around very much. I do, I like books. I, I do like books. Um, I'm wondering, and like I think um, your approach to decay is really interesting to me, and I can read it very much through the way you engage with materials um, in, in your field work. Um, but then um, in your teaching, um, there was a moment that you were working at the scale of the urban, the city, and I wonder how do you, be, because you know, at the scale of the urban, you don't have that sense of material. But I'm just, I'm just wondering, how would you differentiate your strategy in approaching? Well, I mean, yeah, that's a, <laughs> it's a really central question. I mean, the one of scale, um, and I suppose that the work that we're doing, the work we're doing in the office is getting bigger. So this idea of kind of, you know, sort of finessing every corner has to get more systematized. Um, and then the work that we do um, at ETH and teaching is really about trying to understand this sort of notion of kind of bricolage, uh, you could call it, you know, this idea of sort of um, working with what you're given, but trying to see what its possibilities are at an urban scale. 
I suppose that one of the things that I'm frustrated with or critical of is the idea that urban design deals with big things and that architecture deals with small things because actually we only ever experience a city at one to one you know we don't we don't you don't enter a master plan you just you know your feet are on the ground and it's either mud or it's paving or it's whatever so i suppose it's trying to take an attitude towards a city which is fundamentally based on experience rather than you could say uh, um, a a more ab abstract entirely abstract construction of systems that say transport or um, you know or other kind of you could say uh, systematized forms of knowledge and um, so that's why we start when we do these urban projects we'll start with a survey because it forces you to spend time there it forces you to kind of look really quite carefully at what's there and that that is the beginnings of the project and I suppose that you could call it from if you look at that thing, you know, Gandhi and Soane, you know, the trajectory goes right back into something like Piranesi. And I think, I think it was in Pierre Vittorio's book that I read that Piranesi had worked for Nolly as a draftsman. And maybe, I think maybe you wrote that, or I conjectured it, that he sort of then, when he started making his surveys, the surveys were his fictions. You know, they, the, 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 uh, the relationship between the analytical and the synthetic is kind of completely, is, is completely dissolved. And I think that the, so the idea of these urban projects really starting with a survey, which is hopefully rigorous, but cannot be true because you omit things and you select things, and that's design. So to me, I suppose that the work is trying to connect the kind of the urban um, and the passage of time in the urban, as well as the passage of time in the, yeah, at the kind of human, human level, at the, you know, all of this. I think we'll stop there. Tom, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you.